Tom Jones uh, has a big reputation and that his topic is the magic of laughter and rather than <coughs> preempt what he's got to say, I'll let him say it all. So here he is. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. All the male audience haven't done those for a long, long time. <laughs> oh, he's a bloody Do you remember the pleasant Sunday mornings we used to have years ago? Yeah. Anybody attend those? No, oh, they were nightmares. <laughs> no, it's truly. I, I, I was booked to, most of the time I was booked for a football club, uh, for a club whose team had lost the day before. <laughs> and you'd stand here, the bar would be there, so you'd be there, and everybody would be standing at the bar, commiserating and bemoaning the fact that they'd lost. And I was using a microphone <coughs> with a lead that led to a, a speaker on the rafters hung by the actual wire itself plugged into the thing which was dangerous and every time I walked past it it went beep like that. so those were the days now we've got look at all this beautiful technology all this wonderful stuff oh it's gone um, <laughs> all this wonderful stuff and we have to we can relax so it's lovely to be here thank you very much my topic of course is the magic of laughter basically what it is is talking about laughter and whether we get enough of it whether we really uh, do enough of it um, uh, are there any old people here, by the way? <laughs> no, I have to be careful. I have to be careful what I'm saying because people can get offended. Oh, I don't mind old people. So if you ask a person, an old person, how they are, and they tell you, don't they? <laughs> I remember doing a gig not so long ago, and uh, in my shows now, I try and do as much variety as I can. I used to be a stand-up comedian where all I did was stand there for 45 minutes to an hour just talking. These days I'd fill it with songs and, uh, and magic, etc. And uh, obviously the magic, uh, the songs of the era that we were all brought up in, the 60s, so rock and roll. And uh, I was just packing up, going away, and an old lady came up to me on a little walk. <coughs> pointing my that the way they do and she said thank you very much I had a lovely time I love the rock and roll it brought back a lot of memories she said thank you so much you did a lovely job which was nice and then she reached down and squeezed my bum <laughs> I said come on love act your age and she died so <laughs> as a comedian you've got to be careful what we say because uh, people get offended very very quickly um, now you days you can't say ladies and gentlemen, it's ladies and gentlemen and for those of you who haven't decided yet. Uh, but it's an old gag, but we still use that sort of thing. But these days, you know, we've got to be very careful. Uh, but I'm not expecting anyone to be offended today. And what I want to do, I want to encourage you to laugh as much as you can. For instance, this morning, when you leapt out of bed, that's <laughs> oh, always a slow one, that one, isn't it? <laughs> yes, left out of bed. We don't leap out of bed when we get to a certain age, do we? Funnily enough, we do when we get cramp. Have you noticed that? <laughs> you can get out of bed pretty quickly like that, so I don't know what the difference is. But when you wake up in the morning, you usually wake up to bad news. In the old days, you used to wake up to music. You know, na, 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 it, and, and you felt good, you know. But these days, things—it's on the news that things have happened, and you go, oh, "God, is it worth getting up?" You know, oh, God's sake, you know. So we've got to sort of encourage ourselves, really, to wake up in the morning. People, a lot of people have forgotten how to smile. You know, it's—it's it's quite easy, but you wake up in the morning and go, "Oh shit." <laughs> and it's not a nice thing. And remember, a laugh will cheer everybody up, not just you. When you wake up in the morning and you start, and you can make someone laugh, you've cheered yourself up, you've cheered somebody else up. And let's face it, what a laugh is, it's positive. A frown or anything uh, like the opposite, obviously, to a, a, a laugh is um, misery, you know, a frown. And that's a downward thing. But a laugh, it's an upward thing, isn't it? You, you, when you laugh, your eyes light up, your, your face lights up, everything that droops goes up. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably not everything, but yeah. <laughs> gravity's a powerful force, isn't it, really? <laughs> so you've got to follow, encourage yourself 
to get out there and make, not so much make people laugh, but at least be pleasant. You know, because there's, as I say, there are a lot of miserable people out there. And people's lives are shaped in many, many ways. Experiences, things that they've gone through. Um, some people say our lives are shaped by the stars, by the universe. I've got a different theory. I think a lot of people are shaped, their lives are shaped by shapes. Now, the reason I bring this up is that uh, I did dabble in uh, psychiatry at one particular time, and um, I did have a practice. Not many people know that. You knew that, though, didn't you? Yes, you were a patient of mine. Uh, I can't discuss what we were talking about, but it's nice to see you back in men's clothing again. <laughs> Apes. This is a little chart that I this is a little chart that I think you might be interested in. As you can see, it, it, there are individual shapes. There's a circle, there's a triangle, there's a square, and there's this particular shape, which many people will know or not know. Do you know what that one is? Infinity. Infinity. <laughs> are you drinking now? <laughs> you can't. It's infinity, yes, whatever the infinity is, it's forever thing, isn't it, really? So, but people are attracted to these signs. You are probably attracted to these signs. What I want you to do, I want you to pick a sign, choose a sign, but don't tell anyone, just keep it to yourself, because then we're going to discover what kind of person you are, all right? So, have you chosen all your signs? Everyone seen that? Have you chosen your sign? Yes? All right. Okay. Who chose the circle? Okay. Quite a few. Now, those who chose the circle, a circle a symbol is a meaning of universal, sacred, and divine instances. It represents the infinite nature of energy. Uh, if you chose the circle, you're well-rounded and balanced. You're a great believer in karma. What goes round, comes round. Yeah, it's interesting. Who chose the triangle? Oh, man, okay, the triangle. Of course, there are three parts, sides to a triangle. Uh, and everyone thinks that threes, that everything that comes in threes are funnier and they're more satisfying, more effective and they're more memorable. Your uh, motto is third time lucky. <laughs> so if you bought two tats lucky, lucky tickets today, buy another one because that's the lucky one. <laughs> and the square? The square? All oh, right, not so many this time. The square has four sides, obviously. There are four seasons, spring, summer, winter, and autumn. There are four elements, fire, water, earth, and air. If you chose this symbol, you're a perfectionist. Would that be true? Your motto, it's better to be perfectly useful than uselessly perfect. <laughs> no idea what that meant. Who chose the infinity sign? These people are more interested in sex and booze. <laughs> I didn't see which one you chose. <laughs> so, uh, my path to what I'm doing now, and you never retire in this business, um, because if you love it that much and you're doing it and you're having fun and always making a little bit of money, you don't want to stop. You don't really want to stop. When we when we had COVID, it was quite a bad time for entertainers in general. Uh, luckily, the government came to uh, our assistance and gave us some money, which was very nice. Uh, very nice, actually. Not. At that particular time, because they were paying me because I was out of work, uh, I was earning more money then than I was the year before, which was nice. It was seven hundred and fifty bucks a week. Uh, thank you very much. I usually stand up for two hours for that one. So. Um, uh, it all started there, and of course, things that you, you do uh, as an entertainer are more energetic than anything else. And so, when you the older you get, the more you start to feel this. And what's happening now is that if I have to travel a long way, I'm more exhausted when I get to the gig and I do the show, which you find energy from there. I do the show, and then when it's finished, you go back. So it it means I, I'm. <laughs> It's more wearing at this particular age. I still love it and I still do it. These days I'm um, writing a lot more. Um, I'm involved with a group of senior citizens 
those are old people. <laughs> uh, and they want to be on the stage, they want to do something. So I've written plays and pantomimes and such, and I'll put on a production down in Sorrento, and they had a sellout house, and they had a ball. It was one where write ups in the paper. So it was self fulfilling to me. I was paid for it, obviously, but that's, that was beside the point. The idea being is that I'm more active now rather than retire and it makes me feel more fulfilled and if i'm getting laughs out of it that's even better so i encourage you people more to laugh and find something you can do you know that, that will make people laugh wear silly clothes you know i wasn't looking at you in particularly i'm sorry about that but you sit up the front <laughs> Uh, I, I was brought up in a, a time of uh, people were unusual. My parents were in the business. My father was a comedian. I think I was one of his jokes. <laughs> my mother was, uh, they were a song and dance act. And uh, I had um, siblings who went into the business. And, uh, and I also had aunts. I had an auntie, an auntie Flory. Uh, and a Florence, she preferred. We call her Auntie Flurry. She was a she was a magician's assistant for a while, and then she decided to branch out on her own and become a ventriloquist, which was unusual in those days. You didn't get many female ventriloquists, but she was wonderful. She uh, did ventriloquism, and she she did the act mostly in the nude, when nobody ever saw her lips move. Anyway. <laughs> She was married to my, my, of course, my uncle, Uncle Eugene, who was an Irishman, Eugene O'Connor, he was, and is um, a contortionist, very thin man, very slim, and I say slim, he was really thin, thin legs, and he, as a contortionist, he would tie himself in all kinds of knots, etc. You know, if you've ever seen a contortionist, mostly it's females, and it's unusual to see a, contortion, a male contortionist. And uh, it, it was wonderful. It was, it, was, it was so thin, he parted his hair in the middle so he wouldn't overbalance. And um, <laughs> his act was brief. In, uh, was I come from England, and in England the acts went on a circuit, and it was usually a theatre circuit. Uh, they didn't have clubs in those early days when my parents and uh, my grandfather was uh, working. And you would turn up at the, at the, uh, the theatre and of course the acoustics would be great and you wouldn't have uh, microphones. And, uh, so his act consisted of two assistants taking um, uh, a trunk on stage. The, Orchestra, the pit orchestra would start the music. It's usually Oriental type music, and a spotlight would hit, pin spot, go boom, and then there'd be a boom, and the lid would open, and my uncle Eugene would come out and sort of do all kinds of contortions, etc. And uh, it was incredible the things, and some of the positions he was in. My dad used to say he's the only bloke I know who could look up his own end, and <laughs> but. He would come out and then when he, when he finished the act, he would come back, step inside the trunk, the lid would close, and then the, that was the end of his act. Amazing, and he did that right until the day he died. It's amazing, isn't it? He died on stage as well, which is what we all want to do, what so entertainers want to do. He died on stage. It was very sad, but of course he died in his own arms, so that was comforting, wasn't it? <laughs> So basically, I went into that particular kind of business, and uh, um, I, I, I performed at a place called Butlins, Butlins Holiday Camp. There's any English people here? You're nodding. Have you been to a Butlins Holiday Camp? You have. I think you're nodding. So, thank you. You're so encouraging. Thank you. <laughs> I wish some of them over there would nod. Uh, some of them nodding off. Uh, but uh, that was a, that was an instruction, a uh, 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 how-to. Kind of thing. I didn't go to a school to learn. I, I, I learned from uh, the people I was, that was around me and, and experience. And in this particular instance, when I was at Butlins Holiday Camp, Butlins Holiday Camp was um, a huge resort um, uh, that run by Billy Butler and the eye just uh, not after just after the war and people would need a holiday and they would go when everything was provided you know like a sort of a stationary cruise ship really and everybody would turn up and we as redcoats <clears throat> would welcome the people into the the place and the obvious thing was to make them happy and laugh and do whatever they had to do i remember my first morning 
Um, we all, they all uh, resided in chalets, which were wooden huts. They were called chalets, we called it sounded posher, you know. And they had a, a did you remember, remember the tannoy system? The big bullhorn thing that would all sound. Good morning, campers, it's time to get up now. It's 10.30 in the morning, and we've got so many things to do today. Dippity do now, zippity, it's 7.30 in the morning. We've been up to, for an hour or two. And that's what you were greeted with first thing in the morning. You were on holiday and you had to get up at 7.30 because today was the day you were going to enjoy yourself. And I was down at the canteen and it was a huge place, probably the size of this uh, hall head, probably even a little bit bigger, with rows and rows of tables and chairs, etc. And everyone would go through the cafeteria and pick their food, usually uh, eggs, sausage, beans, chips, tomatoes, fried bread, all the things that would kill you, you know, that's, and they would come out, and then they would come out, and it, it may have been me, I don't know, I stood and I watched them, and they, it seemed as if they all started together. The noise, it was, it was the first time I've ever seen sparks coming from knives and forks. And, was, <laughs> and we had to go backwards and forwards and enjoy. And enjoying the food. Lovely. Don't forget to join in there later on in the day. We'll be we'll, we'll at the pool and we'll, all that sort of thing. People are, <laughs> that's what our life was. I remember one time the manager came up to me and he said, oh, he said, you do a bit of magic, don't you? I said, yes, I do. He said, all right. He said, the, the Punch and Judy man's sick. He says, you're going to have to do his spot. Uh, he says, 11.30, don't forget to be there. Go down and see him if you need any instructions, because I've never done a Punch and Judy show. I, I'd seen one as a boy, etc., and I knew exactly what was going on. <clears throat> I knew there was Mr. Punch and, and his wife and, and all the stories, you know, and, 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 and the slapstick. And uh, so I went down to see Fred, who was in bed. I said, you know, well, I said, no, no. He said, I said, well, all I do is spot, I don't know what to do. He said, well, he said, it's all set up. He said, you've got no worries, just go down there. He said, now, the, the theatre, you go in there, he said, now, Mr. Punch is on the right. He said, always on the right hand. You know, it's tradition, it's tradition. We have a lot of traditions in theatre. If we don't uh, conform to tradition, it's bad luck, all right? So, no, and everything else is all right. He said, and don't forget to tie the sausages down, because the little bastards pinch them. And I said, all right, I said, it's all referring to the children. And um, so I, he said, now, I said, what else do I need to know? He said, well, he said, don't forget the swazzle. <coughs> I said, what? He said, the swazzle. I said, what is it? Now, it was a secret for many years, the swazzle. It was the, the, um, the thing that was made to produce Punch's voice, which was a high, squeaky kind of thing. I think I can explain it. I've got one somewhere, but I can't find it. But. Um, do uh, you remember coming home from school and you'd put a leaf between your thumbs and you'd blow it, beep, like that, at a high, well that's basically what it was, it was a, two pieces of either pewter or silver in a, a, a half arc like that and then the, the bias binding would go round the top to keep them together and then there would be a thin sliver in between and that would vibrate and make the the noise of the squeaker. And uh, he said, now what you do is you put it in your mouth, put it in the back of your tongue, press it up to the, the roof of your mouth and go <coughs> like that. I said, right, okay. I said, he said, go on then. He said, there it is. So I picked it up and I put it in my mouth. I said, now, right, on the back of your tongue. I said, all right, okay, okay, okay. And he said, now, so press it up to the top. I said, okay, okay. He said, anyway, okay. I said, what happens if I swallow it? He said, don't worry, it'll come back. <laughs> he said, I've swallowed that four times now. <laughs> But I learned the skill of the swaddle, and I learned the skill of puppeteering, and I brought that when we came to Australia. So these things are handed on to you, and you learn these, and you do these with experience. And uh, uh, so laughter's been pretty much part of my life uh, all the time. I was, uh, when I first came to this country, um, I started at a theatre restaurant called Hancock's Theatre Restaurant down in Mount Eliza. I don't know if anyone remembers it. He was there for about eight or ten years, then he moved up to Sandringham. Mm -hmm. And then I was with Terry Gill at the Naughty Nineties and uh, the Tivoli Theatre Restaurants um, up until 2011. So the theatre restaurant has been part of my life. So I'm always looking for something to do to make people laugh. Um, <clears throat> now I'm going to try and expertly segue into something else which. Um, 
I'm not sure. So I don't do this very often and I'm, I occasionally forget. Oh yeah, um, when you're looking for laughs, it's very simple. Um, and I noticed you told a joke today, which, which is, that, is that normal? You, you sort of read out a joke. We did have a <coughs> raconteur, but he uh, passed away. So not today. <laughs> <don't>. <laughs> Try to resurrect it. <laughs> that's okay. Not sure what that means, but uh, <laughs> yes. Um, but that's great. You start off with a joke, but you and uh, but you've got to be able to tell the joke properly. It's okay to read it, and it's still and people still get it. They still get the joke. But uh, the part comedy is um, I can, how can I describe it? Comedy is just a surprise and a funny picture, like people slipping on a banana. It's a surprise to the guy, and it's a funny picture, and everybody laughs. It's not very really nice to the guy who slips on the banana skin, but it's not, and it evokes a laughter. That's why a lot of things on Facebook are so popular. The fails. Have you got anybody on Facebook? Or is, no? <laughs> She's too old for Facebook. <laughs> but there is Facebook, and people post these things all the time, and uh, there are people failing and falling, and people crashing, and oh, maybe killed, I don't know, but people put it on and we have a bit of a laugh. So uh, things like that are interesting. So I put together something that uh, may interest you uh, as far as science are concerned, because you see signs everywhere. Not everybody who takes them in, but sometimes you'll see them. For instance, remember the old days when you were looking for a toilet? Um, not at home, obviously. It does happen from time to time when you're at home. Where's the toilet? Uh, but when you were looking for a toilet, you would look for the sign that indicated gentlemen or ladies. Two choices, nothing in between. All right? So, and it was um, a sign that was in black lettering with a white background. You could see it, so you could know. These days, when you look for a toilet, it doesn't say gentlemen or ladies, it's a silhouette. So first of all, especially people who don't see too well, you've got to distinguish which silhouette represents you. And it's usually um, like the green ones, the green exit signs. It's a white background, green, and that's a, a soothing color for people. It's not, here I am. So people uh, are often looking for toilets. You'll see them in shopping centers going. <laughs> but when we go to a shopping center, we've, we've usually, I usually come up to South Bank. We live in Bitter now, which is horse country. And uh, it's a lovely place, but it's, 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 uh, it's a quite a big drive to come into civilization like this. And uh, we, when we go to, and usually when I park the car, we walk into the doors, one of the things which is pointed out by my wife, I'll turn to her and say, I've got to go to the toilet. And she'll always say the same thing, why didn't you go before we left home? And so now she's my mother. But I've got to find the toilet. Now fortunately, because I know Southland, I know where the toilets are. But what happens to a person who's looking for a toilet and doesn't know where the toilets are? And then the signs aren't big enough. Naturally, if they've got any common sense, they will go to the person nearest the shop and ask them, excuse me, can you tell me where the toilet is? And they'll come out and say, yes, it's just down there, and if you just turn to the right, it's, it's okay. And so you've found the toilet. But can you imagine the stress this poor guy or woman's going through every time people keep coming, can you see where the toilet is? So he gets a little bit fed up this, and he says to his assistant, look, I'm sick and tired of people coming in here and asking me where the toilet is. Now make up a sign, I want it on a white background with black battery. And put it out there so that people know where the toilet is. So the first sign they put up is this. For toilet, use stairs. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else who was trying to be helpful put another sign after that and said, slippery when wet. <laughs> I found the toilet and then opened up the cubicle door and somebody put another sign up. It said, do not put anything but paper in the bowl. Now, if you're a literal person, you're going to be in trouble, aren't you, really? So these signs, although they are uh, short and to the point, they can be rather amusing and bring a smile to your face. Some of the other things that, uh, that occurred to me is that um, there are a lot of people, uh, people like ourselves, who've got children, had children, now we have got grandchildren. And of course, our children, our grandchildren, are the smartest, cleverest, most talented children in the universe. Don't we? Correct. Right. Of course we are. We, we love our kids, but there are some children who are not as bright 
And the reason I tell you is this, is because you'll see signs indicating the same thing. Slow children at play. <laughs> Why would you put up a sign like that? Then I thought, oh, of course. They must be children of council workers. <laughs> you see that often, don't you? Slow men working. I was in Dandenong not so long ago and I saw three can uh, two council men working, actually working. And one was digging a hole and the other one was filling it in. I said, what's happening here? He said, I'm number one, I did the holes. He's number three, he fills them in. Number two plants the bushes, but he's sick today. <laughs> Now, if I've got ladies in the audience, I usually ask who's had their ears pierced. Is anybody here, um, have you ever been pierced? No, I don't mean pierced, I mean pierced. Now, I, it, it doesn't appeal to me either, but they do, they have their ears pierced. And I often say to them, we were attracted to this by a sign, for instance, like this. Ears pierced while you wait. Did you go in, take off your ears, put them on the counter and say, put a hole in there, I'll be back in 10 minutes. No, of course you didn't. There was one particular person that was a little bit more uh, creative and he said, ears pierced while you wait, pay for two and get another one pierced free. <laughs> It's the same with tattooing, isn't it? When, usually I, I associate tattooing, tattooing with getting drunk. And I don't have a tattoo. I don't. These days, it seems to be a fashion statement now that everyone has to be tattooed. I don't know why. I'm sure uh, one or two of you have been tattooed. I'm not going to ask you to show us, but, the, the, but it's usually discreet. It's usually something that is... But now, it's just like a walking picture. And I remember my granddaughter, who still lived near us, as I say, we've moved from Frankston. She lived just down the road, and uh, she's a goth which is, I don't know, well, she's a pug now, which is a goth with colour. And, uh, <laughs> and she's a lovely girl, but, you know, a bit weird. And uh, she's got a boyfriend. And that they announced the fact that they were vegan, which is another great fashion statement now that we've all got to follow. Um, uh, she used to pop up every now and then, and give her lunch and she, she came up and she said, hello granddad, I said, hi, hi, you come up for lunch? Oh yes, she said, she said, we're vegan. She announced it as if, just like, as if it was a challenge. We're vegan. I said, oh, just great. I've just mowed the lawn, you're fine. <laughs> and she's lovely and her boyfriend, Liam, who's about seven foot 12 tall, thin as a rake, both vegans. He works on the uh, meat counter at Coles. I can't understand, you know. <laughs> and she announced the fact that she had a tattoo. And I said, oh, really? Now, my uh, first reaction was to ask where it was, not what it was. Because, you know, they put these tattoos in all kinds of funny places. And I said, well, where is it? She said, it's here. And she pulled a, a cardigan down, and there it was, a, a little tattoo. And I said, what is it? She said, it's a blackbird. I said, oh, right, very nice. I said, you do realise when you're 65, it'll look like an ostrich, don't you? <laughs> so you wonder why our grandchildren hate us sometimes. <laughs> I've got a friend who's got a pharmacy, um, and his pharmacy is on a, a shopping strip. Uh, so everybody's passing by, etc. And he's just installed some uh, doors that open uh, automatically. It's all around us, of course, you walk towards it, and shh opens like that and uh, you walk in. The trouble is that, uh, of course it's, uh, for those who are technically minded, of course it's operated by a little um, a light or something. You know, I'm not technically minded, obviously, otherwise I'd be able to describe it better. But as you pass this, it breaks the light and open it comes, you see. I don't know. So the dog will do the same thing. So he's been having dogs come into the, into the shop and of course he's constantly saying, get that dog out of here, get that dog out of here. Then he had a brilliant idea. He thought, oh, right, oh. And he said to his assistant, now, make up a sign that you can put it in front of the shop and see if we can stop these dogs coming in. So this is the sign he put up. No dogs allowed except seeing eye dogs. <laughs> and I said to him, uh, do you think that sign's very useful? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, who's the sign for? I said, dogs don't read. 
I said, there's no disrespect to their owners, they're not going to spot it either, you know. I said, why don't you just employ somebody to stand outside and every time a dog comes along, get out of it, right? You've got somebody employed, haven't you? But no, no, these are signs that are there, obviously, to instruct, but just miss. Like this one, anyone exiting through this door will be asked to leave. <laughs> Part of what I've done over the years, um, and most people laugh if I can, is um, mind reading stuff, you know, where you can pretty much like when I open here with these those shapes, etc., and, uh, and guessing somehow or predicting someone's card or whatever it might be. So I'm always interested in that sort of thing. When I was in Frankston not so long ago, I know just a sign outside the library, it said, Psychic Meeting 10 a.m. And I remember thinking at the time, if you were a psychic, surely you'd know what time the meeting was. So I thought, what kind of psychics are in there? So I parked my car and uh, I went inside. And there was another sign, it said, meeting cancelled due to unforeseen circumstances. So, which again, is sort of deleted the object. But I didn't mind so much, except that when I came out, I had a parking ticket, which no one likes. Uh, and I couldn't understand why I would get a parking ticket because I was parked right by a sign that said fine for parking. So, <laughs> I like, this is my favourite. Nine out of ten people cannot read. Are you one of them? <laughs> <laughs> I like magic and I've always um, sort of tried to include it wherever I can. And I remember the first trick. Uh, that uh, I learned, and uh, actually it was the second one. The first one was pull my finger, but um, <laughs> that was my grandfather. <laughs> Can't do that now. People get offended. <laughs> so, um, but uh, I tell you, I, I, I remember the first time I saw a magician. As a magician, these days, if you see a magician, apart from the ones in Las Vegas where they dress up fantastically well, and uh, you'll probably find some magicians will come up to you and ask you, you know, can I show you a trick? If you've ever been to a place where uh, a magician has been going around the tables, and they're usually in torn jeans and a t-shirt that said I'm the greatest magician in the world or something like that. But in the old days, if you saw a magician, if, or if a magician was performing, he would perform as a magician. And he would have a top, a black top hat, he would have tail coat, uh, and he would have um, a white shirt with a white waistcoat and a, a white uh, bow tie and patent leather shoes. I always loved the patent leather. My, grand, my uh, father had patent leather shoes because he was a dancer. They were known as pumps, dancing pumps, but they were patent leather. They flashed as they went by. So I always went, oh look, we've got patent leather down there. Look at that, I love it. Patent leather sneakers. Um, <laughs> Do you do a lot of walking? Uh, no, but they do. They, they're impressive, aren't they? I mean, the moment you walked into the club, people go, look at those shoes. Okay, so, congratulations, they look great. Um, you didn't buy them online, did you? A hundred years ago. <laughs> yeah, online. Don't buy things online. You're on over if you're on the line. <laughs> so, they painted the picture of this uh, wonderful magician, and I sat there, I was seven years of age, and I thought, oh, this is going to be great. He's going to come out, and he's going to, he's going to get doves are going to come out of his sleeves, and, and flowers, and, and, and silks, etc. Then he's going to cut a lady in half, etc. That's what we think is going to happen when a magician comes, or that's what they assume is going to happen. And um, a lot of people, when I say I'm a magician, say, have you ever cut a lady in half? <laughs> Which is a joke, of course. And you'd laugh along and say, Because no. I don't think I would ever cut a lady in half. I mean, with my luck, I'd get the part that eats. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, it's a question of taste. So the first thing he did was a card trick. And I say a card trick, it was sort of, well, let me describe it. He came out and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I have one, two, three, four, five, six cards. Then he did a strange thing. He licked his thumb. For the heart of hearing, he licked his thumb. <laughs> and he took one of the cards from the back, waved it in the air, placed it at the front of the rest of the pack, tapped it down, counted one, two, three cards, threw them in his hat, clicked his fingers, and he had one, two, three, four, five, 
six cars. Now, I was so surprised that I forgot to clap as well. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't clap on your own, somebody will throw you a fish. <laughs> And then he did it again. He counted one, two, three, four, five, six cards. He licked his thumb. Then he took one of the cards from the back. He waved it in the air. He placed it in the front of the rest of the pack, tapped it down, counted one, two, three cards, threw them in his hat, clicked his fingers, and he still had one, two, three, four, five, six cards. <laughs> But as a seven-year-old, I thought, ah, oh, something's going on here. It's not real magic. He's tricking us. It's called misdirection. Uh, he was doing something to distract your mind so that he could do that little bit that <laughs> makes the trick work, you know. And I thought, I'll watch him this time. And so he did it again. He counted one, two, three, four, five, six cards. He licked his thumb. I don't know if he could have licked his thumb. He could have hang down here near his pocket. He could have gone in. And I thought he must have gotten caught up in the air, could have gotten in the air, but I couldn't hurt him again. Could you? <laughs> then he took the card from the back and he waved it in the air. Then as he waved it in the air, I noticed his jacket open here. And there must be an inside pocket in there. He must be putting more cards in there. And I still couldn't quite see it. He put the card in the front as he did before, tapped it down. Then he counted one, two, three cards, threw them in his hat, clicked his fingers. He still had one, two, three, four, five, six cards. Well, I now, people were throwing money. <laughs> now I'm impressed. I'm a seven-year-old, but I'm impressed. And that is magic. And I thought as a seven-year-old, well, if I do everything that the magician did, I can be a magician too. That's all you have to do. You have to remember what the person was doing. And because I was seven, okay. So I rushed up to my mum. I said, Mum, I'm going to do a card trick. Can you, can you, have you got six playing cards? So my mum got six playing cards. She said, here we are. One, two, three, four, five, six cards. Gave them to me. She said, I said, now, Mum, sit down, because I'm going to do a magic trick. So she sat down, waited. So I thought, what did he do first? Oh, yes. <laughs> he licked his thumb. So I licked my thumb. Then what did he do? Oh, yes. He took a card from the back. And he waved it in the air. So far, so good. And then he placed it in the front of the rest of the pack. And then he took one, two, three cards, threw them in his hat. And I said, look, Mum, I've got one, two, three. <laughs> she said, what's wrong? I said, I'm supposed to have six cards. She said, you had six cards. You took three away. You're bound to have three cards. I said, no, but I'm supposed to have six. It's a magic trick. So, oh, of course, she said. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, okay. She said, well, perhaps he said a magic word. I said, well, what? She said, try abracadabra. I said, abracadabra. One, two, three. No. All right, she said, try hocus pocus. I said, hocus pocus. One, two, three. It still didn't work. My dad put his head around the corner and he said, try clicking your fingers. So I clicked my fingers. And I had one, two, three. <laughs> so imagine, like comedy, is a surprise and a picture. I've just given you a surprise. And that's why when people come up to me and say, how did you do that? I can't tell them. Well, it's not that I can't tell them. It's better not that I should tell you. Because, you see, what happened with that particular trick, if you like to call it, which it was a trick, is that it led you along the path, the way a joke leads you along the path. You're going along and all of a sudden they pull the chair away from you or you slip on that banana skin and you get that surprise and you get that feeling of, oh, if I told you how it was done, that oh would go. That's why the Foolish program is so popular because those two guys have seen it all. They want to see something that will make them go, wow. That's the wow factor. Uh, it's, uh, magic is an illusion. To know how it's done, or to be told how it's done, is a disillusion. And that's a downward thing again. You know, you need everything that droops should be going up. And I thought, well, when people ask me how things are done, I, I guess, is it polite to actually say, well, look, what happens is, 
Not really. But if I can show you something and sort of give you a hint, I could give you a hint. And I think that might be the best thing to do. If I give you a hint as to how magic is working, um, that'd be best. I'm, I'm, I'm a member of the magic circle and uh, there's nobody here, there's no one of their spies here, so you have to be so careful if you're in a group like this. They're very protective of everything. So I'm, I'm going to show you an illusion. It's a mini illusion. And, um, and I'll sort of explain what's going on and then you'll get the idea. It's difficult to explain it. So, you see, when a magician does a trick, the audience is basically being hypnotized because they're focused on one thing. You notice that a magician will do things like that. And sometimes people who um, in the audience may sort of have a tendency to sort of fall under their spell. I noticed this when I first started in this business that um, I was doing my act and people started to nod off. <laughs> and I thought, I've got something here. <laughs> so, <coughs> let me explain this, okay, let's go with it. First of all, I've got three pieces of rope. Uh, a long piece, medium-sized piece, and a short piece. And as you can see, they're all different. Uh, the, the short piece is much shorter than the, the long piece, of course, and the medium piece is much shorter than that. And the longer piece is much longer than that one, but the longer one is that, uh, you have to, you understand? Um, so, but people say, oh, well, they trick ropes. Well, yeah, that could be trick ropes. Because you haven't seen the trick yet, so but how do you know how this trick is going to work? So first of all, I'm going to make sure that people know that these are just ordinary pieces of rope. There we go, sir. What is your name, sir? Jeff. Jeff. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Just check the rope and see if you're right. Yeah, sort of yeah, okay. Kind of thing you get in your own bedroom, really, I suppose. <laughs> Paul, would you just check that one? <laughs> and one for you, Howard. Just try that little, little one there. <laughs> yes, yes. So you sm are we going to tie it in or not? <laughs> what did you do before you don't do anything now? <laughs> you retired, are you? Or are you still working? Just. Oh, I'm just. What did you do then? What, what was your job? Uh, uh, it's less it's embarrassing. I'm, uh, I don't want to put you on the spot. No, it wasn't a gelo. <laughs> <laughs> Don't use that word anymore. No, that's true. Dirty old man, I think they use now. <laughs> Finance. Finance. Oh, right. So you're well healed then. Yeah. Well, exactly. Okay. All right. There we go. I've got medium size, uh, short piece, and long piece. Now, I'm going to convince you all that these three pieces of rope are all the same size, which is impossible because you've checked it. You've seen. You've seen that it's a different size. It's impossible. Unless I use the skill of the hypnotist. Now, you don't, you're not aware of this, of course, but all the time I've been talking about this, you've started to go into a trance. <laughs> you don't know this. You won't know this until I click my fingers and you come out of that trance, and you'll feel so much better. All right? And you'll, I don't know why it is, it happens all the time. You say, you know, that trick was wonderful. I feel so much better now. I think I'll get on my bike and run and ride home. So, here we go. First of all, I'm going to confuse your mind. I'm confusing your mind by taking the ends of the rope, the bottom ends of the rope, and bringing them up to the top, so that each rope is of that sort. I guess you could call it a jumble. Okay. So now, although it's in a jumble, you can see that they're not equal. They're all different sizes, but you don't know which end belongs to which end. So, so far, so good. I'm going to have to convince you that these three pieces of rope are now the same size. And this is where the magic comes in. I don't have to say a magic word, I just have to do it. And there it is, one, two, three. One, two, three pieces of rope. I've been doing it for so long that even people in a trance can applaud. <laughs> But I can't leave you like this, because you've got a lunch to enjoy. And I can't leave you in a trance, so now I've got to bring you out. And I click my fingers, and your mind will accept that one is short, one is medium, and the other one, of course, was long. Uh, yeah. And when I first came to the country, I think I was telling you, when I first came into this country, we, uh, there was, we didn't know anyone, obviously. And um, 
the reason I came over to this country was because of my brother. My brother came over because he couldn't get any work in England. It, it was in the 60s. There were, you know, you, you were either being successful or you, you were broke and you were in a, a, a line of people waiting to be handed out money on the dole queue. <coughs> and uh, he said, Dad, I can't. I can't just make it. What shall I do? And my dad said, well, you're young. Why don't you go to Australia? And my brother said, where's that? And she said, down under. Oh, he said, I thought that was China. <laughs> <laughs> I used to have a line up for that, but I went, yeah. <laughs> My dad said it will be one day. Uh, <laughs> but you have to be careful because people get upset, don't they? Uh, so he said, no, he said, they've got a new scheme. He said, uh, 10 pounds, he said, you get over to, uh, to us. He said, and uh, jobs got all. He said, and they're paying double the money they're paying here. He said, wonderful. They all live near the beach. He said, you'll have a wonderful time. He said, and if you don't like it, he said, uh, you can always come back. He said, but I think it's a future. I said, Australia's a future. And he said, oh, he said, he said oh, look, I'll pay for your passage. You know, he said, you'll be okay. So my brother was given the £10. Off he came up to Australia. And he was worried all the time when he was coming home. Because it's eight weeks or something like that. Or maybe a bit longer. Uh, to get there, because you're thinking, am I doing the right thing? Am I really leaving my home and go to a strange country they don't know? And, and he got off that ship and he got a job straight away. He got a job as a long distance truck driver on Phillip Island. Now, <laughs> that was lucky, you know, really was lucky. And apparently he was enjoying himself so much that, uh, uh, being a single lad, being the, all the, the, you know what the girls were like in the 60s, you know, the, the, Having a wonderful, and he kept writing to me and telling me all about this place. By now, I was married, and I was sort of fairly successful in the business. I was doing pantomimes during pantomime season. I was doing summer seasons, etc. So I was doing okay. We got our own house. We got a mortgage. So I guess when you got a mortgage, you know, you're doing okay, aren't you? And I don't worry about it. But he was so insistent that this place, this Australia, was the was so great that he convinced me so we packed up and came over and uh, he told me all about the various things that were happening over here he told me about the Tivoli um, which was still open I think it was 66 it crashed wasn't it was it 66 because of a fire and he said you'll be great he said you come over there he said you don't need you might not get a job uh, on stage, he said, but you could do backstage, you've done that before. So, and he painted a lovely picture, and I thought, well, okay, let's give it a go. So, 20, 20 and I got two kids then. Uh, 20 quid later, uh, we arrived, and um, well, I think I sort of fiddled around for a while, but I got a job. Um, we, we lived, uh, we got a rented house in Glenroy. Glen Roy yeah. um, in Mooney, Mooney Ponds. Yeah. Yeah. No, it wasn't Mooney, it was Mooney Ponds, that was it, obviously. Um, and uh, it was great, and I got a job at Melbourne Zoo, right? And it was a start. I thought, well, at least I'm earning money and I can look around, I can look around for agents and see what the situation was like. So I got this job at, at Melbourne Zoo and it, it, was just, it, was, it was just a simple job, it wasn't anything technical, it was just, well, okay, I was cleaning out cages, all right, I'm not proud, I'm not proud, I don't mind, I'll do anything as long as there's money at the end of the road. So I'm cleaning out cages, you know, I, and there was no training, no special training, I just picked it up as I went along and, and <laughs> And doing all this wonderful stuff, and uh, one day the manager came up to me and he said, "I've just been looking at your um, application." I said, "Really?" He said, "Yeah." He said, uh, "You were in theatre." I said, "Yes, yes." Oh, he said, "That's interesting." He said, "Did you ever do pantomime?" I said, "As a matter of fact, yes, I did. I did and quite a few pantomimes." He said, "Did you ever dress up as a pantomime animal, like a horse or a..." Or a cat, or a cow, or I said, yeah, I was the rear end of a horse once. Which I wouldn't recommend to anybody, <laughs> so especially if your front man's an alcoholic. <laughs> or, I could tell you stories about that bloke. And uh, oh, he said, that's great. I said, well, why are you asking me this? He said, um, well, the gorilla's dead. <laughs> So I'm sorry to hear that. He said, yeah, so we've got to get, it's a very popular animal, the gorilla. So we're going to get another one. He said, it's going to take us a while 
to bring it from wherever it's from the jungle or wherever it is, you see, then it's uh, it's going to have to come across, you know, by ship, and it'll take a while, and uh, then it's got to be quarantined before we can get it in the cage. He said. So, what we want somebody to, you see, we've got a gorilla costume. He said, we want somebody to dress up as a gorilla and sit in the cage until we get the real gorilla. So that people aren't disappointed when they come to see a gorilla. He said, you being an actor and all that, you could put all that on. He said, I can't believe it's an ordinary keeper. So they mess it up, they'd say something or other, and then people say, well, that's not a real gorilla, and then the zoo's going to be in the papers. He said, so do you want to do it? I said, he said, well, make it worth your while. I said, oh, right, okay, well, extra money, that's good. He looked, he said, I'll come and show you what to do. So we went over to the cage, and believe me, and I know it's changed now, I know it looks great now, but then, just a bare cage with bars, just one after the other, and the brick wall behind you with a steel door. It must have been so depressing for the poor animal, you know, just sitting there, you know, in full people going by. He said, now, you'll be here. I said, right. I said, well, what about breaks? I said, I'll chuck a couple of bananas in around about lunchtime. I said, no, I don't mean that. I mean, said, if I need to go to the toilet, I said, I can't be until we get in the... Oh, he said, well, we put a bucket in there. I said, no, no. I said, oh, no, I can't go out of the gents. I said, can you imagine you standing there and a bloke comes in, there's a gorilla there? <laughs> I don't think it would be right. He said, no. Oh. I said, oh. I said look, look, look. I said, look, I've been in theatre a long time. I said, it's all about presentation. You've got to be able to give people something to look at, not just somebody sitting there pretending to be a gorilla. You've got to give them a show. It's show business. I said, so what do you want to do? I said, put a screen up. Put a bamboo screen up, put some fake leaves on it. I said, make it look like a jungly type thing, you know, like Tarzan's house, for instance, you know. And, uh, oh, yeah, she Johnny Wee's mother, yeah, oh, yeah. I said, I said, no, that's, you get that. I said, you can put the bucket behind there. I said, that gives me some privacy and I'll be okay there. No problems. I said, no. I said, now, the other thing is that I don't want to be sitting around. I don't, because, you know, it's boring. I said, no, I, 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 I'll need, if you could put something up with ropes and, and poles and things, and, and I could swing on the ropes, because that's what gorillas do, or whatever monkeys do anyway. And I said, it keeps me occupied and uh, an exercise. So I was, oh, that's good. I said, oh, and I'll do it. He said, okay, Monday. So Monday came around, and there it was, screen, bucket. This wonderful array of ropes and things, like, an, uh, like they have on the adventure program, you know. And I thought, well, this is great, this is good. So I sort of made myself at home, etc. And over the weeks, I got very, very good at it. I started to climb up the poles, everybody clapping, you know, and I'd swing on the ropes and sort of go back from my backs and forwards. And, and I, so everything was okay until one day we got a group of kids, there was about 30 of them. And they're from the local school because they have um, excursions. The teachers take them out and they show them things like that. So they're about seven year olds. If you've got seven year olds in your family, you know what a seven year old is really like. And they're all gathering around, I'm looking and I'm going, I'm just taking a break from swinging. You know, but there was one little kid, just one kid, right on the end. Could have been you, I don't know. But... <laughs> <laughs> Were you seven in 1967? <laughs> But he was, and he was looking at me and he knew I wasn't a real gorilla. And I thought any minute later he's going to say, that's not a real gorilla. And of course the other kids are going to take up the chorus. I can't say anything, because the minute I say anything, that's it, you know, boom. That, a, a nice little learner down the drain, okay? So I thought, what am I going to do to get rid of this kid? Then I thought, oh, I'll, I'll climb up the pole. I'll swing on the rope. I'll do a double somersault. I was, I was very good at that. I could do a double somersault. I could still do one now, but it, you've got to touch me in the right place first. <laughs> and if I do a double somersault and I land next to him and go, <laughs> it'll scare the shit, and it'll frighten him, and he'll run away, you see, so, and that'll get rid of the kids. So, and that's it. so basically, that's what I did. Now, I don't know whether anybody's ever done it. I mean, there are people who have done somersaults, probably from a diving book or something like that. And, um, but it's a difficult thing to do. You have to build up speed. It's like anything that's got anything good in athletics in it, where you've got to flick over and it's, it's and that speed. So, and, and like um, when you go to a circus, you've got the trapeze artists swinging back and forth. What they're doing there, they're building up this speed till they can do this thing. So if ever you want to try this, 
<laughs> Remember, speed is of the essence. <laughs> so I get at the top of the pole, and the kid's still looking at me. And I go to my son and say, Now, what happens is as you, momentum will take you forward, and inertia will increase your speed until you come to a point just before impetus. <laughs> I'm not talking about sex now, Paul. <laughs> His eyes just lit up. So. <laughs> so the point between where inertia ends and impetus begins, you've got to flick your legs over. All right? That's a little technical hint. Right? Okay. So that just basically said what's happening. And this kid's watching me all the time. Down I go, and I'm shh, and I'm just approaching that point where I have to flick my legs over. This kid pulls the biggest cap pistol out of his pocket I've ever seen in my life and goes, BANG! And it's so loud that he surprises me, and I let go of the rope. I'm in impetus now, right? and I go sailing over my cage into the next cage, which is the lion's cage. Right? <laughs> now I'm in the lion's cage, and the lion starts coming towards me, and I start to shout for help, and the lion jumps on my back and says, Shut up, you wallet, we'll both get the bloody sack. <laughs> Thank you. Which brings me to the point I started to make before. Comedy is a picture and a surprise. And that true story illustrates what I mean. Now, when you, when you were laughing, and it was a good laugh, thank you very much. Comedians do get good laughs. Uh, these days, some comedians put small titters or something like that. Uh, but a good belly laugh is just like drugs to a comedian and thank you so much for that burst of laughter but i ask you this question while you were laughing were you thinking about anything going wrong in your life any ache or pain you've got in your body anything like that there was nothing there you were concentrated on laughing and that is the magic of laughter the magic of laughter is a way to keep all those nasty things away you won't cure them but you will make them a little easier to go through your life. I thank you very much for inviting me here, and I hope you have a lovely lunch. I'm sorry I can't join you, but the wife calls. So there it is. <laughs> Where she calls, I have to go. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Don. When choosing speakers, I had three rules. Uh, that I would hope to get at least two of them with every speaker and they will be entertaining, be informative and if possible be humorous. And I think in Don we've had the triple bill. Well yeah, done, Don. Yeah. Thank you, Don. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, do the formal thank you. Um, but I don't think there's much I can add. Uh, I've had a great time. I'm sure everyone else has here. I certainly hope that any retirement for you is a long, long way away. <laughs> Thank you, mate. Thank you so much.